This will take some of you way back, maybe. Over the last year or so, we've rediscovered bubbles. Isn't that good? Come on. I'm right on my Bible. What? Let's, let's try. Let's try another one. Maybe try another one. You know, when you do bubbles, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. They, they, they just don't, get off of there. They just don't last long, right? There was a show on television when I was a kid. Maybe some of you'd remember that others were going to go, wasn't alive then, Rod. They had TV yeah, they had TV then. It was called, <laughs> This Is Your Life. Anybody remember that? They'd bring out an individual, and, and, um, and they would start talking to him, and there would be other people who'd come out, and they would say, hey, Jim, this is your life. Here we go. I think I see bubbles in there. Did it work? So what, the problem with bubbles is like, come on, they just don't last. Oh, fantastic. We're going to be in the book of Ecclesiastes for the next five weeks. And as you see, when you get in the book of Ecclesiastes, it basically says, you see those bubbles? This is your life. You know, you want somebody to say, this is your life, and when they say, this is your life, they want to, you want them to show all the things that you've accomplished, all the things that you've done, all the things you've earned, all the things you've gained. And the book of Ecclesiastes says, your life is bubbles. That's it. Oh, you liked to see those bubbles, didn't you? And they were here, and then gone. You ever tried to catch a bubble? You try to catch it, and it's gone. It's It's gone. So we're going to go into the book of Ecclesiastes, and in the book of Ecclesiastes, we're going to try to solve the question of what is the meaning to life? And some of you are going, I am too busy and too worn out to think about that. And in fact, if I spend time thinking about that, all that's going to happen is we're not going to get a satisfactory answer, so why even look at it? I saw a cartoon a couple weeks ago. Somebody wants to find out the meaning of life, and so they climb the mountain, right? They climb the mountain to talk to the man on the mountain, because the man on the mountain knows the answer. They get all the way up there, and they say to the man on the mountain, what is the meaning of life? And he goes, the meaning of life is this, that you contemplate the meaning of life. Um, the Scripture says, the Scripture says, a life is a breath, it's a mist, it's a vapor. Uh, Job chapter 7, verse 7 says, remember, O God, that my life is but a breath. Psalm 39, verse 5 says, Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. James 4, What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And that's your life. Don't you should pray now and go home. It, when you come to Ecclesiastes, I mean, it, it, it's like, it can be so depressing in one sense, but it's so refreshing in another. So, so, so depressing in terms of where is the hope? I mean, we just finished this series on hope. Where is the hope? But I would encourage you, go to the book of Ecclesiastes. There's a ton of hope here. At least somebody has the courage to say what he says. He has the courage to say what you're thinking or what you're struggling with. And it's like a novel. It's only 12 chapters. I like to read John Grisham, and I like to read um, Charles Martin. Just finished a Charles Martin book, The Letter Keeper. And there was 100 pages to go, and I just wanted to look at the last chapter just to see if those characters were going to be alive at the end. I just wanted to know, but I resisted it. I didn't do it. Book of Ecclesiastes. If you want to, read the last chapter, okay, and you'll, you'll see where, the, where we're headed. But I would say, don't do that. Here's what I'd ask you to do this week. Read through the book of Ecclesiastes in one sitting out loud. It'll take you about 30 minutes. If you can do it in less than 30 minutes, you can read faster than I do. If you do it over 30 minutes, you read slower than I do. So make it a competition. And maybe, well, I don't like to read out. Well, and then to have someone read it to you. You and your, your spouse, read it together. Do it as a family. Read it out loud, one sitting out loud. 
30 minutes. I don't have the time. Yes, you do. Just don't do something else. It's that simple. Read through the book of Ecclesiastes. It'll, it will intrigue you by, the, by its honesty. It'll make you smile because somebody finally had the courage to say it like it is. And you're going to identify with the frustration that you'll find in the book. You're going to identify with that. You're going to feel that. And it'll probably make you laugh. It'll probably make you smile because he's just saying what's going on inside of you. And you're so going to be glad that someone had the courage... Someone had the courage to tell their story. Because in the telling of this story, these words, it confronts you and I with our own frustration with life. Because all of us can get frustrated with life. We want to think at times, well, since we trusted Jesus as our Savior, now the book of Ecclesiastes kind of doesn't apply because we got it all together. We don't struggle with the meaning of life anymore. And that's not true, is it? And if you're sitting there going... Well, I don't know if I agree with that. Well, read through the book of Ecclesiastes out loud and see. So, for those of you who are younger, you're high school, you're college age, you're, mid, you're in your early 20s, you're, you're late 20s, you're going, I-, I got life ahead of me. I got life ahead of me, and I'm going to make a difference. I'm not going to be like the rest of you people. I'm going to, I'm going to make a difference in life, and I'm going to make my, my life count. And I would say, you've come to the right place. Not so much Oakwood, but you've come to the right place, the book of Ecclesiastes. Because I want to tell you that the challenge ahead of you is, is to not end up with what Ecclesiastes says in terms of life being meaningless. What profit is there? Why am I doing this? Why am I on the hamster wheel? Why am I in this rat race? If you're in the middle of life, like I want to think I am, <laughs> you find yourself... You ever find yourself frustrated with, look, what's the point? What's the point? And, and, and it's not just, sometimes, I, I shared this with the worship team this morning. It's not like, you know, those of you who have secular jobs, you struggle with that. So do people in ministry. We're just people. We struggle with it too. And you wonder at times, what's the point? We're swimming upstream in this river of life. What's the point? Or those of you, those of us closer to the end of the story wondering, was my life worth it? Was it worth it? That question, what, what is the meaning to life? We're going to find ourselves in Ecclesiastes. I would encourage you to open your Bible there. If, you, if you're using the black Bible that we have in the back, it's page 461. If you brought your own Bible, another Bible, open it. If you have it on your phone, here we go. Okay? You're going to love it. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Well, that is a really good introduction. That makes me want to read the book. Number uh, Verse 3, what do people gain from all their labors which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. So let's just stop there for a second. The, the, the second verse sets the tone that life is meaningless five times, right? Five times. It's, it's like it's the, it's the bubbles thing. It's, it's bubbles. What, what does it matter? It's empty. It's futile. Verse 3 asks the question, what do people gain from all their labors at which they labor under the sun? In chapter 2, you find it again in verse 11, nothing was gained under the sun. Verse 15 of chapter 2, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? Verse 22, what do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? And the question is, what do you gain? And the answer is, nothing. It's meaningless. It's meaningless. Uh, Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, What does it profit a man or a woman if they gain the whole world and lose their soul? He's saying if you leave God out, you leave Jesus out, your conclusion is meaningless. Verse 4 says, generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. Nothing ever changes. Nothing changes. It's like, wow, there's got to be more to the book than this. Uh, Verse 15, and we'll come back to the other verses here in a second. Verse 15, what is crooked cannot be straightened and what is lacking cannot be counted. I think that is pushing us forward to Romans chapter 8 where Paul writes this in chapter 8, verse 20 of Romans. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, 
but by the will of the one who subjected it. That there is a frustration in life. Life is empty and it is meaningless. Something went wrong. What happened? Verse 5 of chapter 1. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. You ever notice that? The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. It's like, you really want to be a weatherman? I mean, it just... All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. You ever thought about that? Why doesn't the sea fill up? To the place the streams come from and they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear of the hearing. What has, been will, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Nothing changes. And you read this first part of Ecclesiastes, don't get stuck. It's like you're going to get stuck in Ecclesiastes. Uh, verse 12, I, the teacher, was king in Jerusalem, in, over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a great heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, the chasing after when. Who is this teacher guy anyway that we should listen to him? Who's the teacher? It's Solomon. Verse 1 says, Son of David, David only had one son who reigned on the throne. He had grandsons who reigned on the throne, but one son, king in Jerusalem. And, and then if you go back as we read through um, Ecclesiastes, but if you go back to 1 Kings and you read things about Solomon, you find out who this teacher is. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 12, when, when God said to Solomon, Solomon, ask me what you want, and I'll give it to you. Instead of Solomon asking for riches, he asked for wisdom and discernment, so that's what God grants. I will, do, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you've not asked for. It's like, Solomon, you, you're going to have wisdom greater than anybody who ever lived before you and everybody who lived after you. That even today, no one with the wisdom and discernment of this guy by the name of Solomon. Uh, chapter 4, verse 29, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than everyone else. It says um, down in verse 32, he spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. Sometimes you wonder, if the, don't some of the individuals get all the, all the talent? He was just smarter and wiser. What qualifies him to talk to us about the meaning of life? He's wiser and more intelligent than anyone else ever. Chapter 7 of 1 Kings. It says in the end of chapter 6 that he, he took seven years to build the temple of God. It took 13 years to build his own palace. Think about that. Um, and he's, he's this great builder, and you could read through and just read of the things that he built. Even today, it was archaeology. They discovered the, the gates of Solomon, the kind of gates that he made. Um, in chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 14 of 1 Kings, the weight of the gold that Solomon received yearly was 666 talents. That doesn't mean anything to us, so if I said it this way, 400, uh, four and a half tons of gold. What is the, what is the price of gold an ounce right now? Dude, not including the revenues from merchants and traders and from all the Arabian kings and the governors of territories. He has a great throne. There's never been anything like it. It's ivory and it's covered with gold. Nothing like it had ever been made for any other kingdom. All of his goblets were gold. He had a fleet of trading ships. King Solomon, verse 23, was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings. The whole world saw an audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Year after year, everyone would come and they would bring gifts. And it was just like incredible. Everybody recognizes his, his wisdom. They recognize his talent. Verse 11, he has a bunch of wives. kind of wonder at this point, is he really that sharp? <laughs> it, says in, it says in chapter 11 that he had 700 wives and 300 girlfriends. I just don't go there. I, 
that, that kind of makes you scratch your head. I think what is being said as you look in, in 1 Kings and as you go back to Ecclesiastes, you find that he has all the talent, the resources, and the intelligence to answer this question. That if anybody can answer the question, it is Solomon, and he can answer the question. And I believe Solomon is an old man, and he's looking back at his life. He, he's not writing this when he's a young man because he's chasing all this stuff. He's not writing it as a, as a middle-aged man because he's trying to keep on top of it and control all of it. As an older man, he's looking back, and he's saying it's, it's meaningless. It's empty. It's futile. And he's got this internal journey that he's on now as he's evaluating his life and he's honestly talking about it and that type of honesty is refreshing for us that someone has the courage to say it like it is and that's what solomon did what do we typically think when we discover the meaning to life what what do we typically think what, what do we, what, or where do we typically think we will discover the meaning to life? Where, where do we go? Where do we go? Chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what, what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. And it's like he pursues pleasure. They just do what feels good. Do what makes you happy. Just do it for yourself, and that's where you'll find meaning to life. And he says, it's nothing. It's, it's meaningless. He comes up empty. Verse 4, I understood great projects. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs, uh, reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. It, it, there's archaeological evidence that said he had these massive pools with which he could irrigate his stuff. I bought male and female slaves and other slaves who were born in my house that he needed a lot of people to work for him because his company was growing really big. I owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. Not only did he have pursued pleasure and he pursued work, he pursued more. He pursued more. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. He pursued wealth. He pursues money that if I just get enough money, then I'll know the meaning to life. Then I have, will have gained what I was hoping to gain. Still in verse 8 of chapter 2, I acquired male and female singers. Entertainment. He used to entertain himself. The best concerts were, were sponsored by King Solomon. That that's where meaning in life is going to be. Do you entertain yourself? Entertain yourself and, and you just love it. And he said, that's meaningless. I acquired male and female singers and a harem. 700 wives, 300 girlfriends. The delights of a man's heart. Sex. If you just pursue that, and you dive in deep there, then you'll find the meaning to life. Success, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 9. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. He was successful. It was the pursuit of success. Maybe that's where we'll find the meaning to life. Or it's wisdom. He says that his wisdom stayed with him. Verse 10, this, this more thing. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor. And this was the reward for my soul. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done, everything was meaningless, a chasing after wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Solomon dove into the deep end. He had the talent, the resources, the time, and the intelligence to dive in the deep end of all those things we just listed. And he said, it's meaningless. It's empty. It's bubbles. That's what it is. That's his conclusion. And you and I kind of think, well, I can swim too. None of us can dive in the deep end. Right? We can't dive in the deep end like Solomon did. You have all the talent and all the resources and, and all the intelligence and all the wisdom that you need to figure things out. We always know, all of us, we come up on the short end. 
And we dive in the shallow end and we think if we dive in the shallow end of, of work or, or sex or entertainment or success, we dive in the shallow end and, it, and it, we come up empty. We just need a little more. We just need to go into the deeper end. Solomon dives deep. He dives into the deep end. And he comes up empty. And this book of Ecclesiastes is trying to help you and help me not to think that diving in the deep end is going to provide the answer we're looking for. It's not going to give us the gain that we're hoping to gain. We've all, we've all traveled down the road, right? Pleasure, work, more, riches, entertainment, sex, success, wisdom, more. We've all done that. We've all dived into one of them, or two of them, or more of them. We've all dived in thinking, if this just happens to me, then, then I'll find the meaning, then I'll be happy, then there will be gain. But sooner or later, we're like Solomon, been there, done that. Been there, done that. And, and we feel the weight, we feel the weight, everything that's done under the sun, we feel the weight that nothing has meaning. That nothing has meaning and it drives us crazy. Is it driving you crazy? Perhaps that's the point of the book of Ecclesiastes, talking about life, that it's supposed to drive us crazy, that just perhaps there's another answer. Just perhaps there's, a, there's another answer. Years ago, I was it's, um, reading in Sports Illustrated, there's an article on Muhammad Ali, you know the, the boxer guy? And um, he, he, had, he, was way, he was no longer boxing, he was retired, and, and the one who interviewed him said that we went out to the shed, he had a shed in which he kept all of his trophies. Most of us don't keep our trophies in a shed. Okay, I have a shelf, a box, okay? And so, but he's got all these trophies, and you go and he said, he wasn't really taken care of. It was just all the trophies, a lot of cobwebs, birds had been in there, all that kind of stuff on all his trophies. And they asked, they asked Muhammad, well, why, why do you have it this way? And he goes, I had the world, and it was nothing. That's what he said. I had the world, and it's nothing. It was nothing. And I think that's the point. You go into Ecclesiastes and, and you dive into this chasing after the wind of, of pleasure, work, riches, all that stuff. We, we chase that. And, and the point is it, it's to frustrate us, to drive us to, is there another answer? Because whether you're, and you can find this in, in chapter 2, whether you're rich or poor, wise, foolish, successful or not successful, famous or not famous, respected or not respected, you have the same fate. You get to the end of life and you all die. We all die. Wow. Well, wh where, does, where does this chasing after wind take us? I mean, Ecclesiastes is telling us the frustration that you feel with life is good because it's going to drive you to find the answer. When you chase after the wind, here's your conclusion. Here's where you're going to go. Verse 17 of chapter 2. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things that I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to, to the one who comes after me, and who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I poured out my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless, so, I, so my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and great misfortune. What do people get for all their toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. If you chase after the wind, if I chase after the wind, you end up hating life itself. Hate it. The list was it's, it becomes a grievous burden. You ever felt that about your life? Grievous burden. It's wasted effort. You ever felt, don't raise your hand? Because you see, all of us would raise our hand. We should raise our hand, but some of us are, you know, don't want anybody to think that that's us. Despairing of life itself, great misfortune, grief and pain, sleeplessness, unable to rest. Unable to rest. We chase after the wind, and it makes us hate life itself.
Verse 23. All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This, too, is meaningless. When you read through that section, it makes you feel like, I just give up. I quit. Just check out. That's what a lot of people in our world do. That's what a lot of people in American society do. This land of the free and the home of the brave, this place where there's great opportunity, people check out, and it's not because life has been so hard to them. It's because life has no meaning. And it has no meaning, and you just, you just stop, you just give up, or you run back and you try to dive deeper into the pleasure, work, riches, entertainment, sex, success, wisdom, You're always wanting more. Chasing after the wind makes us hate life itself, and it makes us want to give up. But I think that it does one more thing. Verse 24. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This, too, I see is from the hand of God. We need to understand that life itself is a gift from God. Life itself is a gift from God. We need, to, we need to understand that that life and work is a gift from God. Your work is not a curse. It's a blessing. That your life and your work are a gift from God. This too, I see, from the hand of, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless and chasing after the wind. Could it be that the answer lies in a relationship with God? Hallelujah. Where else do you go? Amen. Could it be that the answer lies in the person of Jesus Christ? You could say, well, you don't find the Jesus' name in, in, in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. You don't find the name of Jesus, but Jesus is in there. Amen. He's got a title that's in the book. What chapter? Read it yourself. You find it. On, only God can provide the enjoyment and meaning that we seek. There's no answer to that question, the meaning to life, if you leave God out. There's none. You leave Jesus out. All you have left is bubbles. That's it. That's it. The one thing today is this. Ask yourself the question, am I chasing the wind? Am I chasing the wind? Am I? Is, is my life, am I trying to catch bubbles? They're lasting quite a while. Am I chasing after the wind. Only you can answer the question for yourself. Only I can answer it for me. And if you're frustrated with life, good. Go to Jesus. Heavenly Father, yeah, Lord, the, the book of Ecclesiastes sure does sound depressing. It doesn't sound like there's any hope, but you start giving hints early on that there, there's a direction that you're headed Thank you that Solomon was willing to write down his mistakes. Lord, how could you be so wise and so intelligent, so gifted, and yet be so dumb at times? Lord, we would admit today that we, we at times do struggle with the meaning of life, and we're frustrated with life, and nothing ever changes. Would you remind us in those moments just to go to you, to go to Jesus, to go to your word? Father, may we not be those who chase after the wind. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Next steps, memorize Ecclesiastes 2, 24 and 25. If you don't want to memorize it, then just the concept, grasp the concept. Read Ecclesiastes, the entire book this week, one sitting out loud by yourself with somebody else. Do it. Don't read the last chapter first. I know as I say, don't do it. They we're, we're sinful and we want to go to the do it. So read the whole thing. Do it. And then um, yeah, number three, again, just, just to think about in your own mind, how, how have I chased after the wind? Look back. Just look back. Young or old, how have, how, Roger, how have you chased the wind in your past? It'll be there. Thanks.
the book of Ecclesiastes says that this is your life. God's Word says, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, inasmuch as you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Oh, good. This is not your life. Amen. Amen.